Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, and, and welcome to the 2011 uh, main campus reunion. We're um, uh, pleased and gratified and uh, uh, honored that you've uh, all joined us this weekend. Uh, I'm Bart Moore. I'm a graduate of the School of Foreign Service, class of 1987. Uh, I've been a member of the Georgetown community for 28 years, and I have never spoken from this stage before. So um, this is a uh, this is a this is a meaningful moment for me. Um, my, my sole role this morning uh, in my position as Vice President for Advancement for the University is to welcome you, which I've already done, and to introduce uh, our speaker uh, for this morning's program. Uh, and he, I think, truly, uh, often it's said that um, the introducee requires no introduction. I think that's often the default of a lazy introducer. Um, <laughs> But in fact, in, in this community and in, in this audience, I think um, President Jack DeJoya requires very little, probably no introduction. Let me just, if I may, um, note this summer, uh, this month, uh, Jack marks the conclusion of his 10th year as president of Georgetown. Uh, in, in my business career, I worked full-time for a Fortune 500 CEO. I was a consultant to many more. I have never worked for a harder working, uh, more diligent, more focused, or clearer-eyed leader uh, than Jack DeJoya. And I think Georgetown is in, in very, very good hands uh, with him in the lead. Um, it has been a decade of extraordinary growth and accomplishment for the university, not the least of which is the institutions weathering very successfully um, the extraordinary tumult of the worst economic downturn in 75 years. And I think it was the, the benefit of the eight preceding years of Jack's leadership that allowed us to do that so successfully. Um, Jack is uh, notable among the 48 presidents of Georgetown for being the longest tenured at this institution. Um, when he became president, he had been a member of this community continuously since the fall of 1975. And this summer, therefore, marks the end of the 36th year of his service to and contributions to this community. And as I said, I think we're very, very privileged to have him as our leader. I give you President John J. DeJoya. Thank you very much, Bart, for your introduction and for your leadership here at Georgetown. It's great to have you back here on the hilltop. For members of the classes of 1986 and 91, you might remember Bart during your undergraduate years as a real leader in our undergraduate student body. I've got the opportunity to know him during those years. I was serving as dean of students when he was an undergraduate. And to be able to have Bart rejoin our community at this time in his life, after the kind of career success that he's had, to be able to make the kinds of contributions that he's now making to Georgetown is ex just extraordinary. And so I can't thank you enough for your leadership and for being here. And to all of you, thank you for being, being back here on the Hilltop and welcome home for your reunions. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to be with you this morning. I want to thank you for being here and I want to thank you for the countless ways in which you support Georgetown as volunteer leaders and as donors. As you probably have imagined, um, we're in the midst of a very busy season at Georgetown. It was just two weeks ago today that our undergraduate schools went through their commencements. Over the course of the weekend, if you count our graduate programs, our professional schools, our undergraduate commencements, we had 5,455 students come across the stage and uh, had the opportunity to um, congratulate every one of them. Um, <laughs> In just two months from now, we will be welcoming the class of 2015, which is once again the most selective in our history. Lots of other stuff going on, and, and perhaps um, after I finish these opening remarks, um, be happy to take questions on any of the issues of the day and on any of the activities that have characterized our spring. It's been an extraordinary spring, and it's just a privilege through, through all of these activities and all of these beginnings, when we think about commencement, when we think about the start of a new academic year a little bit later this, this summer, through all of these beginnings, we experience the vibrancy of Georgetown. 
And this weekend, we celebrate the return of all of you who had your own beginning here at Georgetown. And at reunion, we celebrate the lifelong ties that began for you here. This morning, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about Georgetown's future. As some of Georgetown's most committed alumni, all of you in this room are partners with Georgetown's academic leaders and administrators in setting the trajectory of Georgetown's future. And just as previous forward-looking generations have laid the groundwork for the Georgetown we know today, I'd like to talk about how we intend to position Georgetown in service to the world for generations to come. Since John Carroll founded Georgetown in 1789, generation after generation has worked to fulfill and continuously renew his vision for his, quote, little academy on the hill. Across 10 generations, Georgetown has grown to the status that we enjoy today as one of our world's most distinguished universities. And each generation, in their own ways, has embraced the promise of Georgetown's mission. Georgetown exists to promote the creation and distribution of knowledge for the greater glory of God and for the betterment of humankind. We provide a place and the resources for talented people, students, faculty, and alumni to come together to do their very best work, to become their very best selves, and to make a disproportionate contribution to the world. For the greater glory of God, ad maiorum de gloriam, inque hominum salutem, for the betterment of humankind. Those words are right, right up on the wall behind me. Right across the top. The screen's blocking the last part. But ad maiorum de gloriam is the motto of the Jesuits. And our addition to that as Georgetown University are those words in quae hominum salutum. For the greater glory of God and for the betterment of humankind. And across 222 years, Georgetown's mission of education and service has never changed. But the means by which we fulfill our mission is always changing, always evolving to reflect the world of our present and our aspirations for our future. Just in our lifetimes, Georgetown has changed in extraordinary ways. In the 1970s, Georgetown was a great liberal arts college. We had a long tradition of excellence in undergraduate teaching. We had very distinguished professional schools. But like most schools, even the most elite, we were very regional. Half of our students came from the Mid-Atlantic. We operated on a campus that housed not even half of our undergraduate students. Anyone prior to the class of 1991 will remember the lottery for on-campus housing to cope with just the shortage that we had. Graduate programs were few and small. The faculty were first rate, but they spent almost all of their time teaching. Now consider that when I arrived as a freshman in 1975, we had approximately 1,800 beds on campus. And today we have 5,200. And every student who wants to live on campus can. This is a vibrant residential community. We've constructed academic buildings, a field house, a student center, a performing arts center, on-campus apartments for faculty and residents, we recruited a steadily larger and ever more distinguished faculty, women and men prominent in their fields, many of them national and international thought leaders. And we had a very successful basketball team. And wherever our team went, they carried the name of Georgetown. And today we're a preeminent national research university with an internationally recognized faculty and students drawn from over 130 nations who live and work together on a residential campus. We are home to a growing number of very distinguished graduate programs, and our faculty are able to balance teaching with original research in ways that make them better and more effective at the teaching, the imparting of knowledge and learning that remains our deepest purpose. And Georgetown has accomplished all of this as a Catholic and Jesuit community 
committed to the values that have defined us throughout our history. Georgetown today is one of the great universities in our world. But consider these numbers. We're the 12th most selective undergraduate school in the country. Our law school is ranked 14th. Our most recent medical school class had an admission rate of 3.6%. And US News ranks the university overall 21st. But our endowment is only 61st in size. In this number lies the challenge for those of us, including each of you, who lead Georgetown in this generation. How do we keep this extraordinary momentum going, a momentum that reflects our commitment and our fulfillment to our enduring mission? How do we sustain our mission in our time, in our place, like the generations of Georgetown who preceded us? One part of this answer is to develop a stronger financial foundation to ensure that all of the achievements of the last generation are sustained and that all of the promise of the future is realized. Now, as what we near what we all hope is the end of the worst economic downturn in 75 years, it is time for us now to focus more aggressively on this challenge. And so to do so, we will launch a little bit later this year the public phase of the most ambitious capital campaign in our university's history. Our last campaign, which went roughly from 1996 to 2003, we raised a little over a billion dollars. And this time we're aiming for $1.5 billion. It's an aggressive goal for a university with a 27% giving rate among alumni and a history and a culture of giving that really only goes back about 30 years. Our $1.5 billion goal includes four major priorities. The first and most important priority is to significantly increase support for scholarships and financial aid, both in terms of endowment and current use dollars. Some of you may have joined us for meetings in different parts of the country over the course of the last 18 months as we launched the first part of the public phase of our campaign, what we call the 1789 Scholarship Imperative. We did this in advance of the university-wide campaign, the public phase of the university-wide campaign, because of the urgency and the importance. At $500 million of the $1.5 billion, our goal for undergraduate scholarships is the single largest piece of the campaign. And we've made a good start We've raised just over $100 million, $110 million for scholarships so far toward this goal of $500 million. In addition to undergraduate scholarships, we've established a $100 million goal for graduate student scholarships and fellowships, making our total scholarship goal $600 million. Our next largest campaign goal is to raise $400 million to invest in our academic programs, particularly and specifically our faculty and their research, all to sustain our tradition of academic excellence. This will allow us to recognize the performance and potential of our current faculty, to fund the recruitment of the very best new faculty, and to invest in innovation in teaching and learning. Next to ensuring that the very best students can come to Georgetown, there's nothing more important than investing in our faculty. Another big part of what we do as a university is to provide the physical spaces for people to do their very best work. And that means we will continue our investment in capital infrastructure with a $150 million goal in our fundraising campaign for, the, for campus and community experience. This will support the construction of our next major facility investment, a new intercollegiate athletic center. We'll also renovate and expand student activity space, provide more study space in Lowinger, and preserve our sacred spaces through the renovation of Dahlgren Chapel, as well as the building of a permanent home for our spiritual retreat programs. It will be called the Calcagnini Contemplative Center, which will be located on 55 acres in the Blue Ridge Mountains, in part due to the $17 million gift from Arthur Calcagnini to create this new center for our retreat programs. 
This goal of raising $150 million for the campus and community experience also includes investments in some of our non-academic programs, including endowing our chaplaincies for our Jewish, Protestant, and Muslim students, as well as continuing to expand career and net networking services for our students. And then finally, a fourth pillar of this campaign, if the first is our commitment to scholarships, our second to our faculty, our third to building the, the, the spaces and the capacity to enhance the, the, the student experience, the community experience. Our fourth pillar is to find ways to ensure we can maintain and expand our distinctive place among the best universities in the world, a world in which we want to seize opportunities that provide us to take the next steps as a university. I believe here our success will be marked by transformative breakthroughs that will define the Georgetown that we leave to generations that follow us. And I'm thinking here about fields like interreligious engagement and environmental studies, global health, human development, transnational law, deepening our already pioneering work in applied ethics. I'm envisioning work here with new partners and collaborators in China, in India, in Mexico, in the Middle East, in Africa, in South America, and in the European Union. I'm seeing learning and study that happens through both physical and virtual connectedness. We set a goal here of $350 million to encompass these transformative opportunities that will, if we are successful, define Georgetown's impact around the globe in the decades ahead. One thing is very clear about achieving these goals, is that we will not be successful without all of you. The potential of Georgetown in this and in future generations is boundless. And we will depend on the support of this generation of our extraordinary alumni to achieve our full promise and potential. As Georgetown's most committed alumni, parents, and friends, all of you in this room will be partners with Georgetown's academic leadership in delivering this new message. Now is Georgetown's moment to set the trajectory for the next generation. And the message to others who are not in this room is simple. There is a way for everyone to be a part of this effort. Every member of our community can participate, whether it's through their contributions to the Georgetown Fund, for those who can make more significant investments, gifts to endowment for faculty and students, or gifts for our much needed facilities. Whether it's participating in efforts to support our students' work, or whether it's spreading the word about this campaign in communities, wherever there are Georgetown alumni and parents, all of us, all of us are called to support Georgetown. We need all of you in this room to help us engage them. Sustaining the path that has characterized our generation is critical, but it's not enough. In the spirit of the Jesuit concept of magis, the Latin word for the more, it's right there in, in that second word, maiorum, the more. We see how much more we are capable of, how much more we can be, how much more of an impact we as a university community of students, faculty, and alumni can have on our world. And we know that success in this campaign will transform yet again the next generation and its impact will be felt for generations to come. Now, I'd like to close my remarks by showing you a short video that celebrates the transformative impact that giving has on Georgetown students. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've raised more than $110 million in scholarship support for students through the 1789 Scholarship Imperative. Alumni support helps makes, po makes possible our commitment to meeting the full financial need of every qualified student who comes to Georgetown. And our position as one of the great universities in the world is inextricably tied to our commitment to having the very best students and the very best faculty at Georgetown. So please, let's take a look.
My name is Guillermo Barriga. Uh, I'm from Denver. My parents are originally from Ghana, so I am the first generation here in the United States. I'm from Durham, Connecticut. It's a small farming community. When I got my admissions letter, the envelope was really small. There's a running joke on campus because acceptance letters come out in very deceptively thin <laughs> envelopes. I called my mom right away. She wasn't home with me, but we were just so excited. I started screaming, and I actually <laughs> twisted my ankle and fell on the floor. Awesome. This is, this is amazing. And then the reality kind of set in, you know, can I afford to go there? Then I received my financial aid package, and I, it was, oh man, I, I, did, I actually didn't know what to do. It's been really exciting. It's been challenging, but it's opened a whole lot of doors for me. Oh, it's been amazing. So far, I'm having the best years of my life. I have made my best friends here, the people who will walk in my wedding. We come here to really strive to make the world a better place. Everybody here respects each other. Here you can be challenged with a lot of the big questions of life. The idea of becoming a different person, of giving back to society. It's going to change and define everything that I can be. I want to be a woman for others. I love this place. I'm proud to be a Hoya. I bleed blue. <laughs> I'm a Hoya. Hoya for life. Hoya for life. Our identity as one of the great universities in our world is inextricably tied to our ability to ensure that the very best students can be here. Because we meet full need at Georgetown, it allows us to attract the best students where the fit is right, and sometimes the financial situation in the families isn't. If I did not have a scholarship to come to Georgetown, I will not be here. My mom could hardly support us, me and my three brothers. So imagining trying to raise thousands to go to college, that's for me, it would have been impossible. It was everything. <laughs> Without the scholarship, I wouldn't be in this chair right now. I knew that I had to apply to other schools just in case it wasn't feasible for me to be able to uh, pay for the Georgetown tuition. If they really want to be a Hoya, and they're qualified to be a Hoya, and they're admitted to Georgetown, mustn't we make that possible for them to be with us? It's such a virtuous cycle. If you have the best students, the best faculty will come. When you have the best faculty, the best students want to be with them. That's what's at stake here. Georgetown is obviously very selective, but within that selectivity, there's diversity. And that, that is tremendous. It's a privilege to teach these students. People bring different experiences into the classroom. People bring different types of preparation, different worldviews. So it allows us as educators to take already brilliant, talented students to the next level. These students who get financial aid, it's not just that we're investing in them for four years. It's not just about one student. It's not just about the faculty. It's not just about Georgetown University. In order for countries to remain globally competitive, higher education is critical. As a Jesuit and Catholic university, we had better open our doors to all kinds of students and give advantages and possibilities to students. If not, we're really not fulfilling the Jesuit mission. I work in the After School Kids program. We work with kids who've been involved in the court system. As part of their probation, they get referred to our program where we teach them the skills that they'll need to be good citizens. Being here at Georgetown and being in the community, uh, the faith community, the student community, working on campus, being involved in so many organizations has definitely confirmed my reasons why I belong here. Well, I'm a writer, first and foremost, so I do news and features for the paper. And then also I have uh, a, an interview series where I sit down with uh, individuals on campus. So this is kind of like tables turned, right? Definitely. You're being interviewed. <laughs> we believe that for us to be able to sustain our commitment to excellence, we need to ensure the very best students can be here. If you don't have the right people, the right constellation of people in the classrooms, it all falls apart. The economy keeps saying to universities, you'd be better off with a different kind of financial aid policy, with one which does not meet full demonstrated need, with one which allows people to come here if they can pay. Georgetown has rightly resisted these pressures. I have been engaged with Georgetown for the last 35 years. It never lost for me the sense that I owe it more than it ever owed me. The more players there are on the team, the better off you'll be. Uh, this is not a, a game where 10 people uh, 
you know, like a basketball team or 40 like a football team can do all the work by themselves. The university has always had great alumni support, uh, but it needs to become even broader and deeper. All alumni understand that they, they had this tremendous opportunity to attend Georgetown and that there's a real obligation to give back to the degree that you can to enable that, that experience to happen for other students. Who wouldn't want to invest in that? Who wouldn't want to see that as valuable? Well, you can put bricks and mortar up and you have your name on it, and that's a wonderful thing as well. But now you've transformed a life, not just a space. You didn't just write a check. Yeah, I'm here. My life would have been completely different had it not been for the generosity of all the donors. It's a great privilege, great privilege. For me, it was like, I don't have the money, I have the grades, so now I just have to work really, really, really hard to get there. Um, and I appreciate my donors for trusting me that I will succeed. Um, and I believe that I am succeeding. Excellence does not know color, ethnicity, or socioeconomic class. Higher education has been the means by which anyone in our country could place themselves on a trajectory where they could achieve their promise and their potential to the fullest degree possible. And that's what scholarships are all about. I came to Georgetown as a freshman in 1975. And during the course of my undergraduate years, I received need-based aid. I've been at Georgetown since 1987. Absolutely, I'm truly a Hoya. Hoya forever. Go Hoya! Hoya for life. I have my blue Hoya wig. I bleed blue. And gray. Hoya Saxa. I'm gonna love being here forever. We are all definitely Hoyas. Oh, I'm a Hoya. I'm a Hoya. I'm a Hoya. I will be a Hoya for life. I'm a Hoya. 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 I will always be a Hoya. So welcome back. And I'd be happy to take any questions you have on any issues of the day. Rich. Thank you. Hi, Rich Batista, class of 86. Um, you talked about globalization in the speech and partnering, collaborating to create impact around the globe. What does that mean for Georgetown, the word global? Is it sure. about a physical presence? Is it something else? Could you elaborate a little bit uh, on that? Thank, Thanks. Thank, thank you. I think one of the defining questions for us right now as a university community is what does it mean to be global? I think if you look at our history, we've been international from the day of our founding. 20% of our students in, in, in the 1790s came from abroad. Today we have students from 130 countries. Half of our students will study abroad. You know the international character of this place. That hasn't changed in all of our history. But what we're wrestling with right now is this, this notion of global. And when you, when you sort of look at some of the iconography in this room, and you recognize that the Jesuits were the first real global order. And what we're wrestling with now is, does it mean something different today to be global? You, you frame it beautifully. Is it a place? Is it an idea? What we're wrestling with right now is what does it mean to be a global university and does it demand new kinds of things from us? And the way we're wrestling that is by trying some new things. So you see us, for example, with a new campus, a bricks and mortar campus in the Gulf. We're in Doha, in the country of Qatar. We've been there now, this is our, be our seventh year. We've had two, two graduating classes. We were just over just a month ago today for the commencement of our, of our second graduating class. We're teaching international relations to students from the region. More than half of our students are women. These are students we would likely never have an opportunity to educate here on the hilltop. And in partnership with, with the, the, the government of Qatar and also in partnership with six other universities. Cornell University is teaching medicine. Carnegie Mellon is doing information technology and management. Texas A&M is doing petroleum engineering. We're doing international relations. Northwestern is doing communications and journalism. Together, we're part of what's called Education City, and we're trying to see what it's like to do what we do in another part of the world. But in other, in other contexts, we're trying very different kinds of things. In London, our law school has set up a center for transnational legal studies. And together, with 14 other law schools from five continents, we bring together students and faculty every year for, for the year 
some come for the first semester, some the second, some for the whole year, for the purpose of trying to develop a new field, this field of transnational law. We're finding that we, our students graduate, they pass the bar, and then the first cases they get to work on involve cross-border issues that they haven't been adequately prepared for. We also, we have offices now in, in Beijing and in Shanghai. Um, later this summer, you'll see a, a big presence when our men's basketball team travels to China for, a, for a, a, about a 10, week, a 10 day engagement where we'll be engaged in uh, some basketball. But we have deep partnerships right now in China in, in a couple of different contexts. And there, I think, Rich, what's guiding us right now, fundamentally, is we're trying to wrestle with is the meaning of the word global different than it has been in previous generations? What does it require of us? And the way we're approaching it is through partnerships. We're partnering with the Jesuits in India. We're partnering with, the, the, with um, universities in China. We're partnering with the government in Qatar, with a group of law schools in London. Partnerships is the way we're thinking about it and really trying to ensure that we are that our students who will finish here are prepared for their place in this ever-evolving world. Thank you. Yes. Yes, President. I'm Roz Yi, class of 61, back from my 50th. Um, I, as we get older, our concerns are more and more toward like medical, and I like to update on our medical facilities and research. Our, I understand we're expanding. Always, always expanding. Uh, our medical center um, is still wh where you remember it, on the north part of campus. It's a little different, though, than when you were last here. Um, well, maybe not since you were last here, but when you were first here. Um, and that is about 11 years ago, we made a decision to s separate our education and research mission from the clinical mission. All medical centers have three missions. Education, and I gave you those numbers we're very proud of regarding the quality of our medical students. Uh, they're the third, I think, most selective student body in the country with a 3.5% three, three selectivity rate. It's like 11,000 candidates for 200 positions or something. Um, but we remain deeply committed to the mission of education. We also recognize the importance of a university being engaged in the work of life science research. And we do right now about approximately $140 million of life science research at our medical center. It's, it's about 80% of the university's overall research dollars. And that, that, that engagement puts us roughly in the top third of academic medical centers in the country. And then third, the clinical mission. This was a mission that we found we no longer had the capacity to manage. We found this in the mid to late 1990s. And then on June 30, 2000, we sold our hospital to the largest not-for-profit system in the region, and that's MedStar Health. And for the last 11 years, the hospital has been managed by MedStar. Now, if you've been up there lately, you might, in the last decade, you might not have noticed a lot of difference because most of the physicians who were taking care of patients there were our faculty who were part of Georgetown University before MedStar came in. But MedStar is now responsible for the operation of the hospital. And it's been a very good partnership for us. We're always engaged in conversations to try to ensure we get stronger and stronger. At the present time, they're wrestling with some issues related to, to um, uh, the physical plant. They, they'd like to build a new hospital, and we're in conversations with them about how best that might occur. But our commitment to academic medicine has been a core part of the university since 1850 when we launched the, the, the medical school and will remain a part of our, of our future. Let me try and get a few more questions if I can, but I'll stick around after for any other questions. Karen. Um, we, we got a microphone coming your way. Um, I'm curious about your participation rates, and I'm just wondering, actually a little surprised, if that's correlated with your alumni participation in events, and if that figure has been going up and down or steadily up? It's a great question. So we, we have a goal in this campaign to take the 27% up to 36%, and by the end of the decade to get to 40%. We think a university like Georgetown should consistently be achieving alumni participation in our, in our annual fund of 40%. This would put us right smack in the heart of a competitive context that we feel very comfortable with. We would still be trailing some, some schools that you wouldn't like to be trailing. Uh, but 
they set a standard and we'll get there in the next decade. But in this decade, we want to take it to 36 by, by 2016, and then we want to get to 40% by 2020. We're at 27% now, so we're underperforming. Roughly eight, when we, when we do the sort of um, ben, um, interviewing with our alumni, 85% of our alumni report that Georgetown had a profound impact on their lives. And we would think that would correlate to a higher annual fund commitment. Uh, but it hasn't yet. And so we're going about trying to address the issues that will ensure we can achieve, achieve that higher goal. We do get above 30% from time to time. We have spiked. So you might remember a presentation 15 years ago where we might have been at 31 or 32. But the reality is consistently we, we, we're below 30 consistently, except for some variation over a long period of time. And it's simply not commensurate with where we need to be. And so it's part of what we hope to accomplish over the course of this next decade. Yes. Here's the microphone right to your right, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Anthony Munoz, the class of 1961 School of Foreign Service. And uh, I'm very proud of the education that I've received here. It's been phenomenal in my global career. Uh, we have a very distinguished and prestigious Foreign Service School. We probably have the number one master's program in foreign service in the country. It, it is number one, should no confusion. <laughs> I gave you a little leeway. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to know how we influence our government here in Washington in the foreign policy area, in the national area. What impact does Georgetown have on our our government? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I guess there are probably um, you know, two direct ways that, that we, we provide a contribution. One is the day-to-day -day, day -day life on this campus. And it would be breathtaking to come on campus one night and see the depth of engagement that's going on in terms of our students and our faculty participating in the dialogue, in the debate, in the conversation that, that occurs. In this very room over the course of the last six weeks, uh, Gordon Brown was here, uh, Prince Charles was here, uh, the President, uh, I'll stop, we, we can keep going. We, we, we have been a convener of some of the really important dialogue dialogues that have occurred over the course of, of our lifetimes, right here, many of them in this room. And the, our presence here in this city, the city, the, the kinds of students who want to be a part of the life in this city and want to be a part of what we do here at Georgetown, and the faculty that we've been able to recruit over the years enable the richest possible, whatever's happening in the world, there's a, there's, a, there's a debate, there's a panel discussion, there's an invited guest all the time. The second way I think we make a contribution is by the lives some of our graduates lead. And you know, it, was, it was very powerful at different points in time for me in the last few years when you could see uh, the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, a Georgetown graduate, did his PhD here. The Nas National Security Council advisor, Jim Jones, undergraduate, class of 67 here. Um, we could go through virtually every part of the government and you would see honorable men and women who did their undergraduate or graduate training here at Georgetown doing their very best work and trying to make their very best contribution to the work of our, of our country. In addition, we also do that in other countries, too. We had at commencement just a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, the, 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 the keynote speaker for the School of Foreign Service is, the, is an alum of ours, the president of Costa Rica. And we have a few others that we could brag about. I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop there, um, but just simply say that I think the way in which we immerse ourselves in campus life and the issues of the day and the way in which we've provided a, a convening place for, for the discussion of those ideas, and then the kind of contribution some of our, some of our people are making every day is the, are two ways in which we make, make our contribution. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Susan Stuber, college class of 86. And um, I loved being an undergraduate at Georgetown. And the main reason was because of the quality of the undergraduate teaching. And I then went on to graduate school in a place where it was great to be a graduate student because all of the exciting grants and research that you could do, but it was not a good place to be an undergrad right. because the, the pressures crowded out the time that the teachers could spend on teaching and it was farmed out to the graduate students and everything else. So what I wanna ask about is with the pressures on Georgetown to bring in grant money and everything else and be a big research university, what is being done to safeguard the quality of the undergraduate teaching in the classroom? Thank you, That's, it's a great question. Um, let me answer it in a couple of different ways. Um, f you know, first, just anecdotally, I, I still teach and I can just tell you the culture of this place is such that the amount of time I spend in preparation for my, my first year seminar, which I'll do in the fall, it's an Ignatian seminar in the College of Arts and Sciences. The amount of time I put into that is directly reflective of my goal not to be the fifth best teacher that the students in my class have that semester. Uh, I know who else they might have. I, you saw Tony Aaron and Jim Angel and Rena Agrawal, you saw Chet Gillis, you saw those folks in that film. I know there's a chance they could have all four of them in the same semester that I'm teaching them. And I sure as heck don't want to be, the, 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 be bringing up the rear and the quality of the teaching experience that they have. There is a tremendous culture for all of us who teach undergraduates to recognize just how good you have to be to be in the classroom with undergraduates here. Number two, we are recognized as a na national, if not international, research university. And what enables you to, to, to have that identity, which is what our undergraduate students want to, want, want to have in terms of the resources for their undergraduate experience, you need to have a faculty that is at the leading edge of scholarship and research. And the way in which we, we, we've tried to get that balance was in two ways. Between 1980 and 1990, we took our, our faculty here from roughly 300 to 500 on the main campus. And today we're probably, if, you, if we're all in at the undergraduate level, we're probably about 650 today. That's how we were able to get this balance by reducing teaching loads. So when you're in the classroom, you're expected to be every bit as good as you ever were. But we, don't, we, we spread that now among a larger faculty. The second thing we've done is we've been very modest in our decision regarding PhD programs. I'm sure the university that you did your graduate study, studies at has a deeper commitment to PhD education than we can afford. And I'll use this two examples. We have a great overlap, for example, with the, with the University of Pennsylvania. Lots of our undergraduates will apply there or apply here, and we compete directly with Penn for students. Georgetown offers 23 PhD programs, and I'd say in about a quarter of them, five or six of them, we are trying to compete at the very highest level, the very highest. Philosophy, government, economics, history, linguistics. We happen to be outstanding in Spanish and Portuguese. It's just great people there. We really are trying to compete at the highest level in six of those 23, but we want to be very, very good in, in all 23. University of Pennsylvania, for example, has 54 PhD programs. And to put it in another perspective, the University of California, Berkeley, probably the greatest of our graduate programs in the United States, has 98. So we made a decision to be very modest in terms of our expectations. Just given our resource base, we can only go so far. But what we do, we want to do as well as it possibly can be done. And there are a few other things we're number one in. So we, we, we're ranked with Harvard number one in applied ethics. We, we've been a leader for 40 years in the, in the field in philosophy of applied ethics. And we've got a few other number one rankings I could brag about. Other questions? Yes. Right over here in the middle of this row. Thank you, Mary. Hi, uh, Brian Neese, 2001. Could you uh, talk a little bit about what are the challenges that Georgetown faces in preserving its uh, Jesuit mission and yeah. what are the strategies for accomplishing that? Yeah, well, as, as you might imagine, that's been a bit of a preoccupation for me given my rather uh, unprecedented background that I bring to Georgetown. Uh, you know, it's a question I've lived with through the course of my 36 years here. I'll just tell you an anecdotal story. In 1996, I was part of a faculty study group 
we were looking at the question of our Catholic and Jesuit identity. And we invited to campus a very distinguished theologian named David Tracy from the University of Chicago. And one of the defining ideas about Catholic education over the course of roughly 1970 to now the mid-90s, it was guided by an idea called the secularization thesis. And the basic idea is, as you set yourself on a trajectory for academic excellence, to be able to sustain that trajectory, you have to give up your religious identity. And the evidence that's given for that are some of the great universities, Harvard, Yale, uh, University of Chicago, places that began with, an, with a founding religious orientation, but over the course, roughly, in their cases, in the 19th century, abandoning that and moving more towards secular institutions. So we had this great faculty conversation. David gave this great paper. There's sort of this lull in the conversation, so I thought I'd just kind of you know, get it moving just to, and I said, so David, do you think it's inevitable that as we strive for greater and greater academic excellence, we're going to have to uh, re minimize or abandon our Catholic and Jesuit identity? And he said something to me then and to our group at that time that is, I've ne just never forgotten. And that was, Jack, think about the challenges in our world today, the role that religion plays in international affairs, the role, the, the, the d discussions between science and religion, all of these fundamental challenges. Do you think those universities that abandoned their religious tradition in the 19th century would be abandoning it here at the start of the 21st century? And from that point, truly, our Catholic and Jesuit identity is the greatest strategic asset we bring to academic competitiveness at this, at this moment in history. And what we're trying to do is ensure that we leverage every dimension of that resource to ensure that we can achieve our promise and our potential as a university community. So we focused fu fundamentally on four big questions over this last decade. The first question has been interreligious understanding. We had some great strengths, and we've been building on those strengths over the last decade. The second has been Ignatian spirituality, which has never been more available to us, to, to lay people, than it has in the last roughly decade or so. We now offer for our faculty the opportunity to do the full Ignatian experience in what's called the 19th Annotation. This, this wasn't available when, when most of us were undergraduates or even graduate, graduate school. So we've, we've created real capacity to provide our students and faculty with the ability to experience the animating dynamic of, of the Ignatian tradition, which is Ignatius' spirituality. The third has been the engagement with questions of social justice, which have been challenged Father Pedro Rupe, the leader of the Jesuits from 1966 to 80, 83, put on our, on our plates. If you're, if you're an institution that calls yourself Jesuit, how are you responding to the challenges of social justice in the world? And then the fourth question is a broader one. It's, it's a little less easy to be precise about it, but it really is how do we bring the values of our tradition into engagement with the values of culture? And it's an old, an old Jesuit had this idea that the university, the Catholic and Jesuit university could be a place where the university meets the world, the world meets the university. And we've been trying to provide that kind of framework with a lot of the things that you see us doing right now. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of how, we're, how we've been wrestling with it. Uh, I'm, I'm blinded by the light. So I'll, I'll, I trust that you're there. This disembodied voice, and please ask a question, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure Hi, everybody hears it. Over here, more towards the center. Okay. <laughs> I'm Joan Trant, class of 1981. Uh, hi there. What I see you now. School of Languages and Linguistics. Yes. I'd like to follow up on, on your last comments. Yes. Since our mission is embedded in uh, betterment of humankind, yes. I think we have three key ways that we can do that. First, through fabulous academics within this Ignatian ideal of social justice. Secondly, our discussion in the public square. But third, our endowment. That's a great tool for us. So I'm curious to know, how are we looking at investing our endowment, particularly in this burgeoning field of impact investing? Sure, sure. Um, I wish we had a lot more that we could be investing in the way that you <laughs> described. And, um, but, but in fairness, um, for some of you who've been around a while, I think you'll know different roles I've played at the university. At different times in my career, I've been deeply engaged in the issue of social responsible investing. This is a question we're re-examining now. We had a special committee of our, of our investment committee and of our board wrestling with that question over the course of this past year. And it's something we're, we're giving the most careful attention to now. 
how, how can we best use, use our endowment, but I'll be, to be true, truthful about it, our, the size of our endowment relative to our ability to impact is rather modest. Yes? How many Jesuits do you have on the faculty? We have 35 Jesuits on the faculty today, which is about the number that we've had over the course of this past generation. The question was for everybody, how many Jesuits on the faculty? We actually have 65 Jesuits living in the community here on campus. 35 are, are, are deeply engaged in the teaching life of the university. But the challenge that we have is of those 35, very, m most, most are, are aging. So we have two who are, under seven, uh, who are between 60 and 70, two between 50 and 60, two between 40 and 50. So you get a sense of the aging nature of the community. So we're deeply engaged in trying to figure out who, where we can recruit and where people are available. You'll, you, what you would see differently if you went into the Jesuit community today is we do have a number of graduate students pursuing uh, PhD studies here from other parts of the world. And that's helping us keep you know, some of the character of the community. But um, the, the aging religious is one of the challenges that we face at this point in time. Yes. Thank you. I'm Mari Hardikin from the uh, College of 61. And my <clears throat> question has some connectivity to uh, the previous topics of the Jesuit, the mission, globalization, you know, really confronting new forces in the world order. The question is, how do you resolve the eternal question of, you know, are the interests and the, the ethics of potential donors, are they incom not only incompatible with the foundation of Georgetown and its mission, but are they antithetical with it? We see so much of that, and it has to be a great, a great issue for you. So I'd, I'd appreciate some comments. Sure, sure. Um, you know, Clearly, there, there's no uh, gift conversation that we could enter into in which we can't be authentically who we are and true to our, our values and, and our identity. And so um, there are places in, in, where we're engaged in the world where we are asking ourselves questions every day, is this the most appropriate way for us to be engaged? Um, I can give you uh, perhaps a brief uh, recent example of, of the nature of that engagement. And that is one of the things that we're doing right now is um, we've, we have partnered with the um, Ministry for Religious Affairs in China. And chi religion in China is a very complex issue. And really at the request of the church, we went in and began exploring these questions and end ended up into a, a dialogue which is formal, in which we do a conference in Beijing, we do a conference here on the role of religion in China. Uh, as you know, the Catholic Church is divided in China. There's the underground church, and then there's the patriotic Catholic Church. And th this is a divided church. And the goal over time is to be able to integrate and bring these, bring these together. We're providing a forum for dialogue with both with people who would represent the church and pe people who would represent the Chinese government. And that takes place sometimes right here on this campus. And part of what I do, last week I was in Rome for a week meeting with church leaders. And one of the things I wanted to make sure I did was review exactly where we are in this process to make sure everybody was comfortable and understood and supported the role that we were playing. Because we're 222 years old. There's, there's, there are risks we don't need to take. We, we have to ensure that every year, 1,500 new undergraduates coming in are going to graduate four years later with the very best possible experience. When you're 222 years old, you can, you can use, use time and judgment to make decisions as to where you should be engaged. And so in this case, when we signed the agreement here, the Apostolic Nuncio and the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington were present for the signing ceremony for that agreement with that ministry. And I only use that as an example to say the rigor that we bring to every one of those questions as we get out into the world is, is that serious. I hope, that, I hope that's helpful, Ma Maury. One more question. Yeah. Hang 
Uh, my name is Don Twombly. I'm a class of 71 in the School of Foreign Service. When we're talking about globalization and stuff, I'd like to raise a more parochial issue, which is I'm from Texas. Right. Uh, and the, I'm wondering, I was looking at the statistics concerning our, um, our student body, and I'm wondering if while we're globalizing, right. there'll be more of an effort to include other parts of the United States. For example, I think there are very uh, relatively few people from my, my state or even my part of the country. And I'm wondering if there's going to be an effort while we're reaching out to the third world and other places to bring people here, whether we'll try to bring in some people from the United States that haven't been here before. I think that's a, it's a great question. And I want to say two things about it. First, there's something I want to just say generally about globalization that your comment sort of, in, sort of reminded me of. And that is this. We're, we're trying to explore questions about what it means to be a university at this time in history. And there are new forces that we're trying to contend with, these forces of globalization, that we're trying to determine, can they help us become an ever better university? But the one thing that I've learned is that there's, it, you can't become a stronger university as a global university if you are not that much more attentive to what you're doing right here on this hilltop. So whether it's the quality of the undergraduate experience, or whether it's the quality of our medical center research program, or whether it's the commit care and commitment we have to our core identity as a Catholic and Jesuit institution, whether it's the quality of the facilities we're providing our students to, so that we, they know they can come here and do their very best work. If we're not attending to those issues right here, we, we can't be exploring these opportunities globally. So it's trying to get that balancing act. But to Texas, I was born at James Connolly Air Force Base, Waco, Texas. Uh, I have a lot of um, pressure to um, ensure that we attend to the issues of, no, I'm just kidding. California, in, 19, in 1968, Father Joe Sweeney, then responsible for admissions here at Georgetown, made a decision that we needed to become a, a national university from an admissions perspective. That was in 1968. When, when, we, when we applied, um, Half of the students came from the Mid-Atlantic, half from New York and New Jersey. Today, California is our first state for students. And that was a strategy that began in 1968. By 1985, California had emerged into the number three slot by the early part of this last decade to the number two slot. And about three years ago, it became number one. So California is number one. Now, truthfully, if you look at the demographics of our nation and the future of our nation, the roles of California and Texas, and, and which state will be the, the driver of innovation and, and the economy. There's a lot of, lot of folks who think Texas is our future. So I think you're going to see us, in the same way that we began in, in, under Father Sweeney to become more national, you're going to see us moving a bit more. We actually have a, one or two interesting projects we're going to be launching, I think, in the next year in Texas, specific to Georgetown. Um, but we do believe that, our, that our America's long-term future does require a recognition of the importance that the state of Texas, just its demographics alone, it will be an important part of our future. But as you, as you no doubt know, there, there, there isn't the higher education footprint in Texas that was present in California. And so for Texas to be able to get their citizens educated, it's going to require a, a very different kind of answer in this next, in this next generation. And we hope to be a part of that that answer. So I think I had, I, I reached, I'm getting the pull here. So if I don't stop, I'm going to be pulled off. So let me just say thank you all for being here. It's been a privilege to spend this time with you.